I'm going to continue with chapter 5 of the book Paddington at Large and the second part of that chapter. The doctor is out on his rounds, she said. They don't know when he'll be back and they can't even find his locum. They can't find his locum, repeated Paddington, looking more worried than ever. That's his assistant, explained Mrs. Brown. There's nothing to get upset about. We could try a strong dose of castor oil, I suppose, she continued, turning to Mrs. Bird. I have a feeling I don't need more than castor oil, said Mrs. Bird ominously, as Paddington jumped up hurriedly with a feeling better expression on his face and then gave a loud groan as he promptly sat down again. I've sent for the ambulance. The ambulance, cried Mrs. Brown, going quite pale. Oh dear, we should never forgive ourselves, said Mrs. Bird wisely, if anything happened to that bear. So saying, she put her arms underneath Paddington and lifting him gently, carried him into the dining room and placed him on the sofa, where he lay with his legs sticking up in the air. Leaving Paddington where he was, <clears throat> Mrs. Bird disappeared upstairs and when she returned she was carrying a small leather suitcase. I've packed all his washing things, she explained to Mrs. Brown, and I've put in a jar of his special marmalade in case he needs it. What a darling. Mrs. Bird mentioned the last item in a loud voice in the hope that it would cheer Paddington up, but at that mo at the mention of the word marmalade, <laughs> a loud groan came from the direction of the sofa. Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Bird exchanged glances. If the thought of marmalade made Pidding Paddington feel worse, then things must be very bad indeed. I better ring Henry at the office, said Mrs. Brown. as she hurried out into the hall. I'll get him to come home straight away. Fortunately, as Mrs. Brown replaced the telephone receiver, and before they had time to worry about the matter anymore, there came the sound of a loud bell ringing outside, followed by a squeal of brakes and a bang on the front door. Oh dear, said the ambulance man as he entered the dining room and saw Paddington lying on the sofa. What's this? I was told it was an emergency. Nobody said anything about it being a bear. Bears have emergencies the same as anyone else, said Mrs. Bird sternly. Now just you bring in, your, bring in your stretcher and hurry up about it. The ambulance man scratched his head. I don't know what they're going to say back at the hospital, he said doubtfully. They've got an outpatients and an inpatients department but I've never come across a bear patient's department before. Well, they're going to have one now, said Mrs. Bird. <laughs> She's so practical. And if that bear isn't in it by the time five minutes is up, I shall want to know the reason why. <laughs> the ambulance man looked nervously at Mrs. Bird and then back at the sofa as Paddington gave another loud groan. I must say he doesn't look too good, he remarked. He's all right when he's got his legs in the air, explained Mrs. Brown. It's when he tries to put them down that it hurts. <laughs> the ambulance man came to a decision. The combination of Mrs. Bird's glares and Paddington's groans was too much for him. Bird, he called through the open door, fetch the number one stretcher <laughs> and look slippy. We have a young bear emergency in here and I don't much like the look of him. Nobody, nobody spoke in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Mrs. Bird and Mrs. Brown and the man in charge traveled in the back with Paddington. And all the while, his legs got higher and higher until by the time the ambulance turned in through the hospital gates, they were almost doubled back on themselves. Even the ambulance man looked worried. Never seen anything like it before, he said. I'll cover him over with a blanket, ma'am, he continued to Mrs. Bird as they came to a stop. 
We don't save any explanations at the door. <laughs> at the door. We don't want too many delays filling in forms. <laughs> Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Bird hurried in after the stretcher, but the ambulance man was as good as his word, and in no time at all, Paddington was being whisked away from them down a long white corridor. In fact, he only had time to poke a paw out from under the blanket in order to wave goodbye before the doors at the end of the corridor closed behind him and all was quiet again. Oh dear, said Mrs. Brown, as she sank down on a wooden bench. I suppose we've done all we can now. We can only sit and wait, said Mrs. Bird gravely, as she sat down beside her. Wait and hope. The Browns and Mr. Grouper sat in a miserable group in the corridor as they watched the comings and goings of the nurses. Mr. Brown has arrived, had arrived soon after the ambulance, bringing with him Jonathan and Judy, and shortly after that, mis that Mr. Grouper had turned up carrying a bunch of flowers and a huge bag of grapes. They're from the traders in the market, he explained. They all send their best wishes and hope he soon gets well. <laughs> It won't be long now, said Mr. Brown, as several nurses entered the room at the end of the corridor. I think things are beginning to happen. <laughs> as Mr. Brown spoke, a tall, thin, distinguished looking man, dressed from head to foot in green, came hurrying down the corridor and with a nod in that direction, disappeared through the same door. That must be Sir, M that must be Sir Mortimer Carraway said Julie, Julie, knowledgeably. That ambulance man said he is the best surgeon they have. Crikey, said Jonathan in a, in a tone of awe. Fancy Paddington having him. This is an awfully British book. Very nice, by the way. Quite right too, said Mrs. Bird decidedly. There's nothing like going to the top. <laughs> People at the top are always more understanding. Mm, I'm not so sure about that. I feel so helpless, said Mrs. Brown, voicing the thoughts of them all as they sat at, on the bench and prepared themselves for a long wait. They were each of them busy with their own thoughts and although not one of them would have admitted it to the others, even the knowledge that such a famous person as Sir Mortimer Carraway was in charge, didn't help matters. Good heavens, exclaimed Mr. Brown a few minutes later as the door at the end of the corridor opened once again and the figure of Sir Mortimer appeared. That was quick. Mrs. Brown clutched her husband's arm. You don't think anything's gone wrong, do you, Henry? She asked. We shall soon know, said Mr. Brown, as Sir Mortimer caught sight of them and came hurrying along the corridor holding a piece of fur in his hand. Are you that young bear's um, next of kin? he asked. Well, he lives with us, said Mrs. Brown. He is going to be all right, exclaimed Judy, looking anxiously at the piece of fur. I should think, said Mr. Mortimer in a grave voice, but with a suspicion of a twinkle in his eyes, there's every chance he'll pull through. Gracious me! exclaimed Mrs. Bird as there was a sudden commotion at the end of the corridor. There is Paddington, don't tell me he's up already. A bad case of galloping toffee drips, said Sir Mortimer. Most unusual, on the stomach too, worst possible place. Galloping toffee drips, repeated Mr. Brown. I think I must have spilled some on my fur and I was testing it, Mr. Brown explained Paddington as he joined them. They probably said when he was sitting down, said Miss Sir Mortimer. No wonder he couldn't get up again. <sighs> okay. Sir Mortimer chuckled at the look on everyone's face. I'm afraid he'll have a bad patch for a week or so, but I don't doubt if you keep him on a diet of marmalade for a while, it'll start <laughs> to grow again. It should be all right by Christmas. If you don't mind, Bear, he said as he made to leave, I'd like to keep this piece of fur as a souvenir. 
I've done a good few operations in my time, but I've never had a bear's emergency before. What a good job Sir Mortimer had a sense of humor, said Mrs. Brown, as they all drove home in Mr. Brown's car. I can't imagine what some surgeons would have said. <laughs> Fancy keeping Beddington's fur as a souvenir, said Judy. I wonder if he'll have it framed. <laughs> Looking out from behind Mr. Grover's bunch of grapes, Beddington gave the rest of the car out one of his injured expressions. <laughs> He felt very upset that everyone was taking his operation so lightly now that it had turned out all right, especially as he had a cold spot in the middle of his stomach where Sir Mortimer had removed the fur. Perhaps, said Mr. Grober, as they turned into Windsor Gardens, he just likes bears. After all, Mr. Brown, he added, turning to Paddington, joking aside, it might have been serious and it's nice to know there are people like that in the world you can turn to in times of trouble. And to that remark, even Paddington had to nod his whole-hearted agreement. <laughs>